five, which is spiritual, religious, and existential aspects of care. And I think one of the amazing uh, facts about this uh, module for me is that in the beginning of my career um, in palliative care over 12 years ago, I didn't have all the tools in my toolbox to really feel as though I could provide the one-on-one um, -on -one communication skills for this um, type of um, skill set. So it took a lot of um, you know one-on-one -on -one training. I had a chaplain that actually took me under uh, her wing and kind of told, told, talked to me about the do's and the don'ts. And several of us on the palliative care team at Duke really learned a lot from her. Uh, we thought we had the skill set. We had the, you know, the books and we did the modules, but really there was a lot of um, heart to heart discussion she needed to have with us as a team to get us up to speed. Some of the tools um, I will share with you as we move through this module that were very helpful. She introduced us to those tools as well. So with that being said, I'm going to advance the slides. And then at the end, we're going to have Q&A and really would be great to hear from each of you about how your um, communication skills are going thus far um, in your practice settings. So today we're going to apply the principles of communication uh, as I said, to this domain module. And then we're going to really try to identify strategies for teaching communication to enhance um, the spiritual, religious, and existential aspects of care. There are strategies for teaching communication specific to spiritual care, and those are a lot different from the basic communication tools. So that is what will set this module aside from the other communication modules. So really there is a need um, for those of us who are trying, seeking to support our patients, whether it's pediatric or adult patients, um, our cancer patients um, and beyond, really a need for effective communication in this domain. And the first step, as I shared earlier, earlier was for us as providers to admit that we need the help. We need to learn the communication language. What does spirituality mean to the patient? And when we're talking about patients coming from all various backgrounds, we need to be very mindful of that, that there's no uh, you know, one-stop shop or no one, one method that will be effective unless uh, we seek to utilize uh, tools that can help pull out the information that we need um, in order to help patients make the best decisions, but also to share, you know, what is their faith? What is the meaning of their illness? What does this mean for them spirit, you know, spirit, spiritually? And then, you know, how, what is their purpose? How does it align with where they are spiritually? So, and how do we recognize spiritual distress? What is spiritual distress? And what if we have patients that don't wanna talk about this? Where do we go? Who do we turn to? Who else is on the team that can help us? Um, and as I mentioned back in my days at Duke, I had to learn that really the hard way. Um, I had a lot of um, trips and falls with communication, communicating with patients and their families until I learned that you really enlist your team, the village uh, of those who help communicate with patients with sensitive topics and not just try to take it on by yourself. So we talk about the need for effective communication in this domain. It really talk, means assessing the diversity of religious beliefs, right? And the practices, what does that look like? Are there rit rituals that families want to bring to the hospital setting or even home setting if they're um, on a hospice at home? What are their life views? And what does legacy mean to the patient and family? And there are there any unleft tasks that they need to complete and who, um, who on their team in their family or uh, extended family are those who will help them to complete those tasks? Sometimes it's not a matter of getting the information about spirituality directly from the patient. It may be that you're assessing and obtaining the information from a close family member or a very dear friend that's been very similar to a family member. And then identification of spiritual strength within a family and um, the patient care setting is, is vital as well. 
So many of us, when we talk about our legacy, um, going back to what that means, you know, does our legacy include our children, our grandchildren, um, uh, the friends of, of our family? What does that look like? And who, um, if we're in the final hours talking to a patient and family, how do we tease that information out to get the patient to where they have adequate closure? So we'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, the key, as I mentioned earlier, would be making sure that you have the correct assessment tools. We have two very vital videos that we'll review and hopefully at the end, get your feedback about the videos as well as um, how helpful you think that they'd be in your practice setting. So let's go to um, talking about spirituality. Um, definitely that means a lot of different things to several different people. Right? So we'll all admit that we're all at different points of spirituality. And as we read this definition here, um, words that stand out, you know, uh, in terms of humanity. And when I talked earlier about meaning and purpose, um, some people are what spiritual, but not religious. And there are those who are religious, but not necessarily super spiritual. So we need to keep that in mind as we talk to our patients and families. Um, our hospital currently has a, a chaplain team. And so that the team uh, means that there's often someone available uh, throughout the day and even late evenings if we need support. However, I have worked at facilities that has only one chaplain for the entire hospital. And, and those are the types of settings where you really need to try to partner with that chaplain to um, ensure that you're able to um, utilize some of the skill sets uh, that won't overextend the chaplains, um, you know, their services. Um, and so you can, you can very uh, much depend on a solo chaplain, but you can also burn them out by calling them a lot. And at our facility, we had a chaplain that also was the notary that helped with the, um, you know, the advanced care planning documents and the medical power of attorney also was on the scene of um, you know, end of life care and um, the final rites of passage. So we had a chaplain that was doing everything and sure enough, she burned out. And um, luckily we were, we were able to get funding to secure a backup chaplain, but uh, it really takes a team to try to support patients and families uh, from the spirituality aspect. So the next slide talks about what is spiritual care, right? So one of the things that going back to when I first started learning how to implement spiritual care was that our chaplain talked about the need to introduce the chaplaincy team as part of the family support team. So oftentimes when we go into the ICU, we would talk to the wonderful bedside nurse, uh, talk to the ICU team, um, set a plan up with the family, talk even about end-of-life care. But as soon as one of us on the team would say, and do you want the chaplain to stop by? The family would often say, no, we don't. And that was even if the patient was nearing end-of-life. What that told us as we talked to our chaplain colleagues about that language of, do you want the chaplain to stop by, was that some families fear that calling a chaplain is really the end. Even if they're nearing the end, they don't want that reality. So they'll say no. What one of our chaplain team members actually taught us to say was, do you want the spiritual support team to stop by? A member of the spiritual support team to stop by um, or the family support team member to help you figure out your rituals and the need for prayer. Almost 100% of the time, the family would say yes to that um, question being asked in that, in that manner. So that's just something to keep in mind. But when we talk about spiritual care, it really talks about honoring the dignity of every human being, making sure we're considering how a person finds meaning. It may be very different to how we find meaning. Um, and then we must explore and ask questions and practice humility um, as uh, with patients and definitely know that some people may not want to see um, a chaplain or a spiritual uh, support member. So being able to articulate and ask the question at the right time in the right manner does, ma does matter. And some families may say, no, I don't want any spiritual support right now. And then you may be able to ask them a few days later and they may say yes. 
So, you know, the prescription for good spiritual care is compassionate presence. And many of you on um, this call today are leaders in your field. You're very well aware and very versed of, you know, what it means to provide compassionate presence. Um, when I first took LNIC years ago, we had an exercise called a listening exercise. And I thought it was very, very funny because actually you practice how to listen. Uh, we had a segment where there was a, a, a speaker and a listener and literally being the listener for three whole minutes and not being able to talk was like torture. And many of us learned during an exercise that, wow, you know, listening is an active sport. You really have to practice listening. Uh, so that was one of the things I'll always take uh, from my beginning uh, with LNIC training. So social supports are critical. Um, and this study here talks about uh, cancer patients indicating that their strong social support have really decreased their mortality risk. So as people come together to support a patient and family, you know, there's a sense of well-being mentally where people feel like, you know, things are coming into place, even though my life is nearing an end, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm facing death, it's not as scary when I have my family as a team working to support me socially, making sure that my rituals and my spiritual needs are being supported and that, hey, today I don't wanna answer any questions about my fears um, and, and providing any information about what meaning is, but perhaps there's a family member that would speak to the, the chaplain or um, the, the providers about what, you know, what my desires are because today I'm just too tired. So social support does matter. Um, this in itself with spiritual care and support means that you're gonna be talking to more than just a patient. Very often you're gonna be engaging with additional family members or friends to get the information that you need. So here's an interesting communication vignette. Uh, related to religious beliefs, and we're going to have some questions um, that we can pose afterwards. I'm going to stop sharing at this time, and Rose is going to share the video. Perfect. My we got it. Holly. I'm the nurse that's on the palliative care team that's going to be hey helping there. to take care of you. Hi. I wanted to stop nice by to and you. introduce myself to you. Thank you. And ask you, is this a good time to Come by yeah, and sure. have a talk. Yeah, oh, have good. A seat. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a privilege to be here with you oh, and thanks. to be part of, of your care team. Thank you. It's it's been a rough week, but um hopefully it'll get better. I'm sure it, it has been a rough week yeah. being here. Yeah, yeah. I um I, I have to be honest about something. I hope I hope you don't okay. mind. Um but when I came in, I filled out this form about mm -hmm. uh, what blood products I was willing to accept and not accept. And um, I asked, you know, for the band that says bloodless medicine and I never got it. So that's one of the things I, I did mention it to the night shift nurse last night and I still haven't heard about that. And so mm. um, that's been a little bit stressful for me. Oh, I'm I'm sure it has. I'm yeah. sorry that that's happened. I can assure you that when I leave here, we will make sure that the nurse comes back okay. in with that particular band okay. and get that for you so you have it on. Thank you. That Appreciate sounds that. like that's pretty important to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am a Jehovah's Witness mm -hmm. and um, unfortunately, you know, the last hospital I was at, uh, it was in a different state, but um, I just had a really hard time like trying to explain who I was and what I wanted mm -hmm. and I just felt like as soon as I said Jehovah's Witness, there was a stigma attached to me. Um, which I don't understand because I feel like, you know, other religious groups, they say what they are and everyone's like, oh, you know, that's great. You know, we appreciate diversity and all that. But as soon as I say what I am, um, it's like people think I'm really weird. And um, it's just it makes it kind of hard for me and my family to be here. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that um, and the bad experience that you had before and and that we haven't exactly started off with getting you the band that you need. Yeah. I hear how important that is. And, yeah. and certainly part of the reason I am coming by is to get to know you a little better. Thank you. To help you, you know, with this journey Thank and you. your treatment, but also to make sure we have a better understanding of who you and your family are Thanks. and what's important to you and what we can do on our team to make sure that your wishes and 
I certainly honor your, you know, your religious background. Thank you. And your preferences and and the bloodless. Yeah. Name well, I, I can say one more thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's already December twentieth, uh, and everyone's getting really excited. You know, mm -hmm. for the holidays. Um, you know that the nurses have been decorating the unit uh, and like bringing in Christmas trees and stuff. And I just, I would really rather not. Um, we in in my faith, we just we don't set that aside as a special day. We have one special day a year um, close to Passover, but um, I'd rather not have all the Christmas decorations. Um, that, that kind of is in my face. Oh, um, I'm. It, but I appreciate you know them trying to make it like home. It, that just doesn't feel like home to me. That's not your home. No, yeah. no, no, no. And we can certainly, it's so helpful to hear what's acceptable and what isn't yeah. so that we can make sure that we don't overstep our bounds Thank too. You. I, you know, I, I know that I, it's important for us to understand more about your faith and your practices and knowing things like that, yeah. you know, are really helpful for the nurses and, the, and the whole staff to know so that we can be respectful of what, you know, what you would yeah. like. One other thing, what are the mm. visiting hours on the unit? The visiting hours here should be whatever you would like them to be. Okay, because um, my elder did say mm -hmm. that um, he was going to stop by. Um, I don't think he has that clergy badge because, you know, like in right. our faith, we don't have oh, reverence. Know. But um, if there's a way to make sure that security will let him in, like even if it's late at night or something, I would really appreciate that. We definitely have open visiting hours. Okay. And again, I will share with the nurses, if it's okay with you and the staff, that the elder from your community is very important to you. Thank you. And, yeah. and his name is she, Roger. Roger. In case you guys and that Roger will be coming and that he needs to be um, able to, to talk with you and be with you. Thank you. Would it be helpful if we put a sign on the door when he's here visiting with you? Oh, that would be awesome. Okay. Yeah, we, we usually like to study scripture together mm -hmm. and um, and honestly, I don't I don't actually need the chaplain to come because he's really my go-to person um, and it's, it's just really important for me to have someone who shares my belief. I've noticed a lot of the other chaplains don't necessarily have my faith and so um, again, while I appreciate the effort, um, I'm fine with just my elder coming. Well, I will make sure that that happens. And before I leave, I'll recap to make sure I have all the key things that we want to remember. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's really important for us to hear from you what what you would like us to do and not do. Thank we you. want to do everything we can to honor it. Thank you. So let me just be sure that we have things. First and foremost, we get the band on. Yeah, please. And then I will let the staff know um, and make sure that they have on your chart that you, know, you are Jehovah's Witness to honor and respect that, to ask questions of you that you're open to yeah, that. Yeah, I'm if, fine with that. Yeah, to make sure that the Christmas decorations and the things that they're putting up are not in your room or on your door. Yeah. Thank and you. that Roger will be coming. Yes. That correct? And that he is an elder who is in the equivalent of clergy right. in, your, right. in your practice. And that it's important that he have some quiet time alone with you. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, and I, I think my husband will be here too. Put a yeah. note on the door so that unless there's something emergent that they don't need to That would be great. Okay. Thank you so much. It was nice oh, to meet you. It was you. nice to meet you too, Thank Hannah. you for Look listening. to being part of your team. And uh, don't hesitate to ask for us or to speak up if there's anything that's Thank that's you. Concerning. Thanks for sitting with me. It's so rare that someone will actually sit down and listen. Yeah. It's a privilege. That. It's looking forward to working with you these next few, Thank you. few days and helping get you through this. Thanks. This we, we feel better here already. Oh, good. Thank good. you. Okay. All right. Have a good have one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So that was an interesting vignette. I think what stood out to me about that was that the patient was able to articulate directly what she did and did not want. <laughs> I love those types of patients and families who are very direct because it does gear us into the right direction with supporting them. Oftentimes to get the kind of information in the video that Polly Masnick was able to elicit or obtain from the patient, takes just a few quest uh, questions, especially if the patient's frustrated. Um, the great thing is uh, us, as providers, we can um, document these discussions and have a bullet point list of what the patient does and does not want. Makes it much easier for the primary team and also for your follow-up provider, whether it's you're on the oncology team or um, you know working with a palliative care team, it does uh, make it easier when um, you come to patients like this that have direct um, request to really document what they like and what they do not like. 
So we'll talk about these questions at the end when we have an open segment, but we'll answer, you know, and debrief about the communication skills um, that you witnessed Polly using. So let's move on to what is spiritual pain. Um, many of our cancer patients, as you know, uh, do have a, a lot of things going on in terms of how they're trying to figure out um, life and meaning. Um, you know, the term hope is often used, especially um, even nearing end of life, uh, where patients fear that someone's trying to take away their hope. Um, several patients do struggle with self-worth and, you know, as we talked about their legacy and meaning of their illness and what it means for their family um, in terms of relationships and um, often ter uh, terms such as God, spirituality, um, regret and forgiveness come into play. And then some people may or may not be ready to talk specifically about death and what that means and what they want that to look like um, in terms of death. So living with questions that patients um, have, oftentimes uh, we as providers must realize and actualize that we don't have to have the answers. Um, when I mentioned the listening exercise earlier in this segment, listening is, is exactly the skill set and the tool when um, you know patients come to ask very tough questions of you, um, you know, such as, will I suffer? You know, why is this happening to me? I was a good person, you know, I helped uh, everyone in my family, I worked hard, you know, why am I being punished? These questions don't necessarily need you answering them as providers, it's often very hard for us not to answer or to feel that we need to reassure the patient that, oh, there's nothing that you've done to bring this on yourself. I've used those terms um, as just reassurance, but the key is really to remain as silent as possible, nodding, leaning in. Those are listening aspects and tools that are very helpful. Um, also, other uh, evidence-based uh, statements that providers can utilize are, tell me more about this. Um, and this must be difficult for you. As you remember in the video, Polly did exactly that. She repeated exactly what the patient said when she said she was frustrated. Um, and that's, those are great statements to do. It helps the patient to further reflect. Um, these open-ended statements do continue the conversation uh, with the patient without you having to intervene or give too much of your own feedback. And then, of course, towards the end, um, as you're um, wrapping up with the patient, Oftentimes I'll say, um, is this a point where you're okay with me giving you updates or sharing some information about what may have helped other patients? And then your patient may say, well, yeah, um, I've talked a lot now. It, it'd be great to hear what you think, you know, what you recommend. And at that point, once you give the invitation um, and the patient is re receptive to you giving them more information, giving them information, that's a point where you can disclose or give information that may be helpful um, but again, be very cautious about giving direct advice because as you can see with the patient in the video, she was not, she was not very happy about what um, the team perceived as her needs, um, hanging various decorations that were not aligned with her spiritual or religious beliefs. And then the team um, not ensuring that she had on her blood ban, those types of things. Polly would have never gathered that information had she not been silent and use, utilizing her listening skills. So acknowledging the reality and reframing questions, um, those are really, really great, um, you know, tools to utilize. Again, I go to the tell me more um, statement quite a bit. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can utilize when you talk to patients. And when you want, have those patients that are very quiet, you know, you can start out the sentence with asking them, you know, what's most important to you right now? Um, and you can help direct them to articulating what's most important, what are they wishing for? And if they talk about quality of life, you know, how do you define quality of life? What does that mean to you? Um, and they may, may need to break down what they mean about quality of life. Does that mean, you know, being free from pain, having their nausea and vomit, vomiting better treated so that they can enjoy some of their favorite meal times with family. Um, and those types of things might need to be um, further discussed. So we're gonna skip this spiritual assessment vignette because we have another um, one at the end that's gonna be very helpful. 
Uh, but the FICA of spiritual assessment is the one I mentioned in the beginning that as I was being trained years ago by a chaplain team member, the FICA spiritual assessment was a tool that uh, very vital to utilize in the um, oncology, um, ICU, uh, patient care setting nearing uh, end of life. And also for patients such as the one that um, Polly talked to earlier in the video, when they can articulate clearly what they want and don't want, this type of assessment is, is very good to utilize. So let's break down what FICA means. So faith, belief, meaning um, deals with the F. You know, is spiritual, spirituality or faith important in your life? You know, what does that mean? What are some examples? And sometimes patients will be forthcoming. Uh, one tip with utilizing the FICA is that some patients may only be able to get to the first part of it, the F and the I. They may only be able to talk about their faith, belief, and meaning and the importance. So you may have to come back at another visit, especially if you have a patient who's um, extremely fatigued, come back and do the C and the A, and that's fine. And then we talk about the importance and influence. How does your faith and spirituality influence your life? So um, for instance, um, an example with me is, um, I have a subset of people in my life that really are very close to me, near and dear to my heart, that I can talk to very openly about my faith and spirituality. spirituality. And there are others who may know just surface information, you know, and so that, and that's fine as well. Find out from your patients how they prefer that information to be shared. They may have visitors um, during your rounds or in clinic where they, they don't want to talk about these aspects in front of their visitors or family. They want more privacy um, when they share the information with you. So the C is for community. Um, very important aspect um, of the religious uh, and spirituality for patients is their community. Who are they? They're not necessarily people who may be your blood relatives very often. So finding out who the community of support is for patients is vital. And then finally addressing an action and care. You know, what do you want uh, us to keep in mind regarding your beliefs? Uh, specifically, patients may list what they want. They want, um, you know, a baptism or they want a rites of passage or they don't want to talk about it at all. And they don't want to be asked, asked about it any further. Uh, so those are very direct, um, you know, requests that we can receive from um, patients in their families uh, related to the spiritual assessment. So here is the wonderful FICA vignette that Rose is gonna share, and then we're gonna be wrapping up um, a couple slides after this. Okay. Um, as I said, I'm the social worker. I'm with the team of palliative care. I'm not sure if they told you I'd be coming by. No, I don't, but we, we could have missed it. We just got some bad news. Oh, golly. I'm sorry. Well, our team is called Palliative Care, and our role is to provide an extra layer of support or perhaps address symptom management. So the primary team asked me to come by to see what I can do. Um, so mm. you, you've gotten some bad news. What, what did you hear? So they, that my, my cancer is bad and there's not much they can do about it. It's heavy. It's awful. Yeah, we. It was pretty unexpected. I thought I was doing pretty, pretty yeah, well. Yeah, we thought everything but, uh, was good. Yeah, okay. I mean, just kind of go along. So, I don't know. Might be an element of shock still going on. Yeah. No. Really. Really. Uh, really caught me off guard. I didn't yeah. didn't expect that. So what, what are you here for? To see what I can do to help. I, what's helped you in the past when you've been dealt with a real, some really bad news or a really tough challenge? How have you guys survived? We've been together a long time. We go through most things together. With We talk it out. We go for long walks. We have a lot of family support. Mm -hmm. That's helped. Got to call the kids. No. So through all this, when you use each other for support, go for walks and use your family, um, how the outcome is better? 
Right. There's something about being mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> being on the beach and yeah. going for a long walk or or that being helps. with the grandkids. We've got uh, a number of grandkids and just uh, sitting on the floor playing with a two-year-old <laughs> helps a lot. Yeah. So I'm hearing the, the grandchild yeah. brings a lot of joy. Right, right. They're getting us through. Tell me more about them. We've got seven. Wow. Right. Wow. Right. It's two new ones and they're big spectrum, but they we go to football games and we with the oldest and we, like I said, play on the floor with the six month old. Mm hmm. So it's, uh, Keeps us busy and keeps us... And you us, can keep doing that. I want to keep doing that. That's a lot of things I can't do. I used to, used to love to play golf and run, and I just don't have the energy for that anymore. And I have some, some pain in my back with some of the mm -hmm. things I try to do, but uh, I guess that's the cancer. But uh, certainly, I, we're not going to stop seeing the family. No. No, they are they're good for both best medicine ever. Right. Mm -hmm. So what else gives you joy? Your grandchildren? Just quiet uh, evenings at home reading and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, spending time together. And I like you know, to read. We're, we're, um, we're not religious if you're here for that. And, uh, no, no. Mm -hmm. We're, we're uh, uh, um, we've not done anything, practiced anything, and I don't even know where there's a God with well, all this. Well, but news like this makes you start thinking. No, but again. we don't, we've not thought about that. Okay. That's not part of our life. Okay. But you, you said well, you started wondering. Well, news Do you like want to this, talk about and you that start more? thinking, start having some thoughts. Uh, yeah, I think that's, Really? I'm not. Well, it, it's... It makes me wonder, it makes me think. Think you know, what? Think about the future, think about what comes next. Oh. Yeah. So are you looking for meaning, um, meaning yeah, for the future? I think, I think, start thinking about what, uh, you know, what I'm, what the future holds and what what I what my part in that is and what you know really what what I'm supposed to do with whatever time I have left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we're gonna fight this thing. We're gonna play with the kids and. Yeah, one way or another, we're gonna do that. But if what the doctor said is true, uh, there's a time limit there. It sounds like you really want to make sure you plan well for the time you have left. Right. Um, whatever that may be, we hope it's a long time, but we never know. But you've got some great things in your life that provide you strength and joy, and you're already making plans on how you're going to continue doing those. We want to do that as long as we can. That's, you know, that's what keeps us, keeps me going. Hey, I'm shocked to have heard you say you had some questions and some doubts. We've never had that before. Are, this are is you things, this thinking? Is a, this is a different. Well, well, so news like that makes you think about a lot of things. But God, really? Yeah. In general, wow. we humans are planners, and I think I've heard from people who who are finding a, something new they have to deal with in their life. They start wondering, "How can I plan for the future?" And I wonder if that's part of your wondering. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I'm, we are planners. I've always been a planner, and, but this is something that uh, is a game changer. It changes everything. Well, are you saying you want to start going to church? No, I'm just saying I want to think and read and talk about it. And uh, Wow, well, that's different, honey. And that's not ever been part of us, but I want to do what you need to do. You, yeah, no. If I, you're thinking about it, maybe we need to maybe, really... Maybe talk to somebody or... Do you have anybody? Well, I start with, did you, were you raised in a faith tradition, either of you? Yeah, I was, but never was, never 
practiced after college, so. Yeah, for some people, that's where they start, go back to their roots and see if that fits. Would that be helpful? Yeah, no, we've never talked about. Well, I don't know, we've never, this is all new. I don't know, I don't know anything. It's but. overwhelming, this whole, yeah. this whole day but is if, overwhelming. If you, if, you know, I want to do what you need to do, so if you want to see somebody. I think it'd be a good thing, maybe. The hospital or someone must have a chaplain or somebody we could talk to. I don't know. Yes, we have a chaplain. It may not be with your faith tradition, but a chaplain who would speak broadly of spirituality. I think, I think that's a, probably a start. So yeah. nobody pushing anything on you. Right. So I can put in a referral for that when I walk out the door. I think that and they aren't going to make you convert or no. You know, they're they're this whole they're, big. They're here is thing. general spirituality, not for a religion. Okay. Right. Well, maybe that would be good. Sure. No, I think we should do that. I'm not so sure, but I'll, I'll do what you want. And going okay. forward, our palliative care team will be with you to help with symptom management so you're feeling your very best every day. So you can Play with those kids. get on that floor right, right. with your two-year-old, you know, and to... that's what we're going to do for you. That sounds... if, if we'll walk with you as, as long as you'd like us to. That sounds good to me. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you Appreciate very much. you for being stopping. so honest and open about your lives. I feel honored. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. As you can see, um, she utilized the FICA and also utilized the statement, tell me more quite a bit to get, get to gather information. And as I talked about earlier, um, you know, patients who are not necessarily religious or spiritual and go back and forth. And in this vignette, how um, it depicted um, how two people, uh, patients and families can be on a different page. And so how we as providers can bring them back together and have the conversation move forward in a direction that's helpful. So, so we'll talk about the vignette debrief uh, once I've stopped sharing the screen. It'd be uh, great to see everyone's lovely faces. Um, and to have you weigh in on the, the vignettes. Um, so as we wrap up, we'll talk about, you know, referring someone to a chaplain is like introducing them to a friend. Um, again, as I stated, I learned very early on that some people are not receptive to the language of chaplain. They want to hear, you know, a family support person or uh, religious, uh, they do want to hear words like uh, religious support. We tended to say a uh, member of the family support team uh, because that included our child life specialists, that even included our pharmacists. So uh, we would say a, a member of the family care support team will come speak to you about whether you want um, to talk about meaning, uh, religious or spiritual practices. And oftentimes patients would say that's fine. Skip that video. So finding meaning in loss and grief, finally, as we wrap up, really entails honoring each person's process. It's gradual. Uh, nothing can happen really overnight. We have had um, instances as the palliative care team where uh, we need to address spirituality rather abruptly because we have a patient that's declining as soon as we're on the scene getting the consult done. Uh, so in those aspects, the statement, tell me more, does still apply and it's very helpful. Um, recognizing that the act of grieving is a part of the healing process. This anticipatory grief that patients and families have can happen very early on in your consult. Um, and so recognizing that you know patients who might not necessarily be declining imminently are still anticip anticipating their own death and their loss of connection from loved ones and families and their loss of connection from their community. Um, so keeping that in mind. And so to summarize, uh, we as clinicians really should be prepared uh, to provide spiritual care, um, taking into account that spirituality means different things to different individuals. Um, that does include ritualistic support. It does include um, recognizing that patients such as the one in the first vignette that wanted her blood band placed on, felt like she was being ignored. That was a part of her being, that was a part of her belief system that was not being tended to. So as providers, making sure that we're attending to every aspect of what 
a patient considers makes them whole and not necessarily boxing patients into what we practice or what uh, we believe they should be practicing. With that being said, I'm going to um, stop sharing and um, let's go back to the vignette questions. I'm gonna give everyone just a chance if you wanna share your um, face and ask questions or give input about the videos. I'm gonna go back to some of the video questions really quickly. Okay, and then while Cheryl's doing that, I wanna thank you, Cheryl, for presenting. Um, your hand up, you can go. Hey, um, just really appreciated this presentation. It was excellent. And I thought the vignettes that were chosen were excellent as well. Um, I loved, um, I'm gonna adopt the phrase of when you speak of a spiritual counselor, speaking to the fact that they would broadly address spirituality. I just really like that phrase a lot, but I, I thought in particular the last vignette was, was really excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. Brenda, if you don't mind sharing a, a background of where you work and how often you um, encounter these types of scenarios with patients. Sure, um, I actually work for Duke, um, and for Duke University and I work, it's, it's a little bit unique in that I work for Duke in another system in North Carolina for Duke and see the inpatients that are diagnosed with malignancy. I'm a clinical nurse specialist and work with an inpatient Duke medical oncology team for another system. But um, just to say, I encounter these conversations very often, at least weekly, um, and have for a long time. And these, really, these are great reminders, just being able to walk through um, how to how to talk with folks and how, again, as you have said repeatedly about practicing presence, and the importance of listening and giving back to them what they have said out loud, and then being willing to, um, as you proceed with conversation, just to respectfully honor them throughout the course of that conversation. I just really appreciate uh, what you had to say. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Anyone else? I've actually put the, some of the questions from the vignettes in the chat. So if you wanted to type in um, a statement or to share some feedback, that would be great. And again, as a reminder, if you're on the phone, you can push star six to unmute yourself to ask a question. Thank you. I felt like on the first video, she could have um, gotten more details about what the patient was comfortable with, like specifically the Christmas decorations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like if she was okay with them being at the nurse's station versus not in her room um, to kind of pass on to the team so that she could communicate those expectations really well with nursing staff, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very good statement. And what's your first name? I'm Megan Cash. Megan, Megan Cash, yes, I remember. What state are you in, Megan? Where, where do in, you work? I'm in Pennsylvania, Lebanon, Pennsylvania. Very nice. Oh, very good feedback. Um, again, um, that statement um, uh, that the patient made was pretty direct about what she liked and didn't like. So I agree with you, Megan. Um, as a provider, we need to tease out as much information that can help the next nursing shift, but also our partners, our, our other fellow providers to make sure that we're, um, you know, paying attention to what's important to the patient. So very good feedback. And anything from the second video, Megan, that stood out to you? I probably would have stopped. I felt like the patient's wife in the video was really given a lot of pushback. And, you know, it sounded like they had a rough day. I probably would not have been comfortable continuing to kind of push them. I mean, I think she navigated it really well, but um, 
I probably would have stepped back and waited for another day. Mm -hmm. You would have stopped the minute you sensed that the wife was kind of pushing back about why you were present. Um, not, not that. I would probably have introduced the role and introduced the idea, but it, it seemed like a lot through the video, she was saying, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. And I might have given them time to speak to each other um, before we readdressed it. Right. Yeah. Because it sounded like in their marriage, in their whole time, they've never discussed some of these really tough terms together. Yeah. So maybe some of their privacy of discussing it further. Okay, that's a great point. Thank you, Megan. Anyone else? I think too, I think what I noticed is um, like how, like I think I take for granted, like sometimes I'm, I'm tending to spiritual needs when I'm focused on clinical issues, you know, cause I think this stuff comes up organically in interactions with patients. Um, and, and I think bringing some more attention to like what exactly it is I'm offering or supporting, I think might help me to better, like be more intentional about it, I suppose. Do you feel like the FICA would, was the way to help do that? Utilizing like the FICA? I, I do. And I love, I mean, I love an acronym. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, because it's like if you get stuck and you don't know what to do next, like you can always go back to that and just pick a thing, you know. So that, I think that's always helpful. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you for sharing that. Where do you work? I'm in Louisville, Kentucky at Baptist Health in their Cancer Resource Center. Very nice. Thank you, Dr. Thaxton. Mm -hmm. And then Cheryl, just real quick, I wanted to share some comments from the chat. Um, so M. Frazier, I enjoyed both videos, especially the second one. Thank you so much for sharing. And then Lindsay Young says, tell me more is one of my favorite phrases to use. I learned it first from reading the book, Tell Me More by Kelly Corrigan. I highly recommend the book. It's not about end of life, but, highlight, but it highlights the use. I was blown away the first time I used it with a patient. I just kept saying it as a patient's husband would talk and he kept offering information that finally led us to solution. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, so the tell me more phrase, um, um, Kelly Corrigan. Uh, what year is that book, Lindsay? She's looking it up. Okay, that's good to know about. Uh, so in the meantime, does anyone else have any more uh, feedback about, oh, 2018, yeah, fairly recent. Thank you for um, mentioning that book, Lindsay. We'll definitely look into that. Um, anyone else with comments or statements about the videos, the vignettes, or the information being shown? Do we feel that we're comfortable, um, um, like Megan said, when they push us away, you know, are we comfortable with stepping away and coming back? Are we comfortable with staying present and, you know, seeing if we can gather more information? I tend to, um, I probably tend to see if I could align with that wife better before I leave, because I'd be worried that if I leave the minute she gets mad, she's gonna feel like she can do that every time I come back. So I would try to stay and align with her a little bit more to kind of gain some more of her trust before I left. Anyone else? <laughs> 